Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends. Today in this lecture we are going to start a new topic that is uh, political theory and its relationship with environment. And we will see that how political theory as a discipline engage with this uh, challenge of uh, environmental crisis or what we can also call uh, climate change or the crisis of ecology or global warming. So, all these terms may have internal differences, but we will take them together to understand how political theory as a discipline engage with this uh, emerging concern of environment, uh, climate change or global warming and so on. So, as I have been saying uh, about political theory that uh, the relevance or the significance of political theory lies in its ability or in its approach to engage with the newer challenges that a country or a society or world as a whole is facing. So, today and in the next lecture, we will focus on how political theory engages with the question of environment, environmental issues and what is the response of democracy or the concepts that we have discussed in this course to tackle or to confront this challenge of um, climate change. So, uh, in this lecture we are focusing on um, the introduction to this issue of uh, politics and environmental ethics. Then we will briefly discuss the idea of gloom and doom that is associated with the environmental concern. So, many of the um, thinkers and activists have argued that uh, the uh, environmental crisis is something which is unmanageable and affecting everyone, even those who have not been the cause of uh, this uh, crisis. So, uh, the uh, reason or the causes of environmental crisis may not be the same people or the same countries as its victims could be. So, um, we will discuss uh, that and then finally, we will uh, in this lecture focus on the democratic response to the climate um, change or environmental crisis. So, to begin with or to understand this new challenge that is uh, confronting the humanity as a whole. So, from the individual and the localized community to nation and to world as a whole is confronting this challenge of climate change or environmental crisis, which requires a global approach. It starts from the individual and to do that one needs to change the attitude, the lifestyle, the values or the preference that is so dear to us and it also lead to change in the whole social political order that we have been thinking of or that we have been trying to organize if we are to tackle the climate change or the environmental crisis. So, the crisis or this environmental challenge or what we can also call the global climate change pose serious challenges to the discipline of political theory. So, the environmental crisis or climate change an issue that is related to that has become a recognizable. So, no longer there can be any deniable deniability or denial of this crisis which requires urgent attention, urgent actions, uh, legislation, uh, discourse or sensitivity to protect the environment or to protect the ecology is a recognizable part of the political landscape. So, in different countries, different communities, um, uh, different states, uh, whether it is from the prosperous country of global north or from the poor country of the global south, they are all now trying to come together to 
confront this challenge and it has become the part of political uh, discourse. It is a recognizable uh, part of the political landscapes in most of the countries. However, in the conventional political theory, the environment as we understand it today or the climate change that we understand uh, in contemporary times was not given as much uh, importance. So, in conventional political theory, the notion of nature or the relationship between man and nature were thoroughly discussed. Especially if you look at the writings of social contract theorists and some of their concepts we have discussed while discussing different concepts in uh, political theory such as Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, we will find a kind of abundance or a kind of engagement with the idea or the notion of nature, the relationship between man and nature, a state of nature and how to overcome it, what is natural law and what is natural justice which should help us to create a society which would be based on rule of law or uh, justice. So, as a notion, as a concept or idea, the uh, notion of nature or natural justice was there, but the it was not seen or it was not envisaged as a kind of entity which may be affected or which could be vulnerable because of the anthropocenic or the human actions or um, uh, behavior. So, we have seen in their writings that the idea of nature, the state of nature, natural law, natural rights were thoroughly discussed, but they did not engage with the question of environment or environmental issue as we now discuss in our contemporary times. So, in the writings, the state of nature was seen as something that needs to be overcome. So, state of nature if you remember Hobbes talking about a state of nature which is war of each against all and the individual behavior in the state of nature is nasty, brutish and sort and therefore, there is no progress of industry, development, prosperity and so on. So, we need to come out of that state of nature and to do that he envisaged the role of uh, Leviathan or the uh, sovereign and then he give the theory of political obligation and so on. So, in this uh, tradition, the state of nature is seen as a kind of problem which needs to be overcome in order to establish rule of law and to do that the natural law again or the principles of natural justice we are seen as a kind of guiding uh, principles or as a guide. So, in uh, this tradition what comes out is an understanding of nature as something that needs to be tamed or control and without mixing the human labor, nature in itself is seen as a waste or something which do not have value or without value. So, in these social contract traditions, nature is seen as of some value when human labor is mixed with the natural resources. In itself, the nature is seen as some kind of entity with no value or which something which needs to be made valuable by mixing it with the human labor. So, the idea that nature might be vulnerable to humanity would have seemed strange to most thinkers in these traditions because they in their horizon of expectations or thinking the idea that nature would be vulnerable to the human actions or human behavior was not non-existence and therefore, their approach to the whole question of nature and how it should be tamed or how it should be made valuable was very different from the way we now associate with the natural resources, environment and talking about sustainable development and so on. So, in their thinking or theorization, this idea that nature might be vulnerable to humanity would have seemed strange to many of these thinkers. In modern times, it is to the credit of George Perkins Mars, who in his book Man and Nature argued about the potential of humans profoundly affecting environment. So, this relationship between man and nature or man and environment in the modern times for the first time argued by George Perkins Mars in his book Man and Nature in 1864. And from there, they begin a kind of theorization or explaining or understanding this relationship between man and nature, 
whether uh, man is centered to the universe or man is just part of so many other species in the world and so on. So, for the first time it was George Perkins Mars who argued about uh, this potential threat that humanity posed to the environment. And in the post industrial society, especially in the uh, countries of north, there were, uh, the growth of many romantic environmentalism and uh, the idea of going back to the nature. This is some kind of romantic uh, ideas, but nonetheless in the post industrial society, this idea was widely discussed and it became a kind of a rallying point to uh, going back to the land, to the pre industrial times and that was a kind of romantic or nostalgic approach to the question of man and environment and especially when the many evils of the industrial growth or the market economy was seen by many uh, scholars, poets and communities, they developed this idea of going back to the nature, going closer to the nature and many uh, theorists or the scholars and the political activists were actually inspired by this idea of going back to the uh, nature and revisiting the relationship between man and nature. Closer home in India, if you remember Gandhi criticizing many of the modern tools or techniques such as railway, medicine, parliament and so on uh, was also to a great extent inspired by this uh, romantic environmentalist or those who were arguing for going back to the nature or living in a uh, close uh, connection or relationship with the environment. So, that is the post industrial time in the contemporary uh, discourse on environmentalism. Rachel Carson's uh, work, The Silent Spring 1962, proves to be a turning point and from then on the question of environment or environmental crisis, climate change, global warming is seen and discussed in a different way and there on you have the growth of environmental movement, green uh, parties or scholars or scientists arguing for protection of nature or environment and so on. Uh, developing international consensus or uh, global consensus to tackle the climate change collectively is given more um, urgency or in serious attention than it was given prior to uh, this uh, book, Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson in 1962. And this Silent Spring gives a kind of scientific or irrefutable facts about the changing climates that leads to the uh, extinction of many of the species which worse effect on uh, the season or the climate and so on. So, since the publication of this book, there have been the phenomenal growth of environmental movements in different parts of the country, formations of green parties, concerns for ecologies or environmental laws that was legislated in many countries. So, in the modern contemporary times, the publication of uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson's become a turning point which leads to a lot of uh, response or different kind of response to the climate change. And in Germany, especially the entry of the green parties in the parliament led to the new kind of legislation and that similar legislation we see in many parts of the country. So, in India, you have the Chipko movement in 1970s which was the most successful environmental movement in the post independent India uh, and that was about protecting the environment and the role of communities in protecting the environment. So, one of the uh, shift in the environmental discourse in contemporary times, it is not just the responsibility and the role of state or the market to fix the environmental crisis, but the individual and communities are themselves coming out or gradually becoming aware of and then responsive to the climate change and the environmental crisis. So, it, it starts from the individual to community to state and market and at the global level and the negotiation or um, modification in the lifestyle, in the behavior, in the consumptions are also changing according to the uh, uh, growth of awareness about the environmental crisis and so on. So, environmental uh, crisis pose serious challenges to communities and modern democracy and the magnitude of crisis is such 
that it requires revisiting some of the core values and preferences of modern lives and politics. So, it puts enormous pressures on democratic political institutions to alter the ways in which we consume, think of development and growth and so on. So, it requires us to revisit some of these notions of uh, our lifestyle, the way we consume things, uh, the idea of development or uh, is it possible to constantly grow in a planet which is uh, having finite resources. So, it requires us to revisit some of these uh, notions. Uh, the environmental ethics focuses basically upon the individual convictions and consciousness and actions towards non-human world and environmental protection as a whole. So, the environmental ethics tries to create a new kind of human or individual subjectivity with a different conviction and consciousness and action towards the non-human species in the planet or even uh, mountains, rivers and uh, their rights. So, in many countries or democracies, you see there are uh, the growth of or the legislation of uh, rights of mountains, rivers as uh, there is rights to individual and also rights to the non-human such as animals and so on. So, it was believed that these new set of values lead to the creation of a new set of social and political order. So, that leads to the uh, creation of new set of social and order when there is a new subjectivity with different approach, conviction and actions towards non-human species in the planet. So, there are arguments that most of the environmental problems are result of anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism basically refers to our moral and political systems that is human center. So, human is at the center of our moral, political, social organizations or system. So, uh, many scholars have argued that the most of the environmental problems and challenges that we have is because of our approach of anthropocentrism which focus, which is uh, human centered and put human at the center of the rest of the species on the planet. This result in the present day environmental crisis. So, although there are many versions of anthropocentrism from weak to the strong, where the, the weak will give focus to the human as the most preferred or rational species in comparison to the other species, but it does recognize non-human species. But the strong uh, anthropocentrism we will believe in the human being as the most or the superior species in the species on the planet. However, the all whether it is weak or a strong uh, version of anthropocentrism all give preference to humans over non-humans. So, ecological modernization is seen as a response to environmental challenge and this ecological modernization theory is basically arguing that as countries modernize economically, politically and socially, environmental challenges are internalized into the prevailing system of governance and production. So, ecological modernization is to uh, modernize, but modernize in a way which uh, protects the environment or which internalize uh, the actions or the values that is required for the protection of environment and so on. This modernization is seen and modernization here means ecological modernization as the ultimate solution to environmental problems. However, many scholars are skeptical of the anti-democratic tendencies lurking behind the idea of ecological modernism and therefore, they argue for a new kind of politics and democratic institutions which would be more sensitive to environmental issue and this response we will discuss which they talk about environmental citizenship or green virtue or a deliberative model of democracy in the later part of this lecture. Now, to understand the evolution of modern political discourse on environmentalism, we need to go back to the decades of 1960s and 70s when this debate first emerged. And in this decade, the writings or the scholarly academic writings on the environmental issue was full of uh, this gloom and doom. So, academic writings on the environmental challenges seriously began to come in late 1960s and early 1970s 
and these writings were full of doom and gloom. So, Paul Ehrlich in his book The Population Bomb 1968 argued that the hundreds of millions of people would die of starvation due to the overpopulation. Similarly, a group of researchers at MIT argued in the limits of growth that humanity would soon exhaust the resource base of the planet. Now, this argument is basically about creating a picture or imagery of the human potential to destroy the environment completely and uh, there is no hope for the protection of environment and so on. So, there is a, a kind of negative uh, approach or uh, assessment of the threat that is posed to environment by the overpopulation or the growth or the mindless uh, growth and so on in the finite uh, resources that is available in the planet. Similarly, Garrett Hardin, the tragedy of the commons, this is the most influential paper to understand the climate discourse or environmental discourse in this decade, argued that how individual benefits from acts that pollute degrade land, change the climate and stress fisheries, but the costs are spread over the entire population. So, each of us act in our immediate self interest, but together we produce outcomes that are worse for all of us. So, the main reason for the environmental crisis according to Garrett Hardin in uh, his influential paper tragedy of the commons is that the individual benefits from polluting the land, the air or change the uh, climate and these benefits are of their immediate interest which is the guiding force for their actions and behaviors in a particular manner which is detrimental to the environmental. So, the cost of environment is or environmental crisis is paid or distributed among all the population. But the benefit out of degrading environment or uh, polluting is limited to the individual and a company or an industrial house and so on, but its costs are shared among the all. So, together when we are guided by only immediate self interest, we produce outcomes that is worse for all of us. So, individually we may benefit out of polluting the land or degrading the land or affecting the climate change, but in the long term collectively we are becoming worse off. So, according to Harding there are two possible solutions to counter this challenge. One is to appeal to the concerns of the individual and community and second is coercion. However, Harding rejects this idea of appeal to the conscience science as an effective mechanism to uh, tackle the uh, climate change or environmental crisis. So, what he uh, argue is that the only possible alternative to tackle uh, environmental problem is the mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. So, the conscience when we change our attitude, we change our convictions, we change our behavior towards climate it will lead to a new set of values which will ultimately create a new social political order which will be conducive for the protection of environment or uh, addressing the climate change. But that is something which is not effective because uh, the cost uh, that is associated with uh, such change in the values or preferences is not willingly or voluntarily being bought by the individual if that is against their interest. So, what he uh, argue as the effective alternative to uh, tackle the climate change or environmental problem is the coercion. When we collectively decide about certain coercion uh, that will force the individual to change their uh, behavior, to change their consumption and so on. So, for him the only possible alternative to tackle uh, environmental problem is the mutual coercion that is mutually agreed upon and that is the only possible and effective way to tackle uh, climate change according to Hardin. Now, further on there is a development of green utopianism and some theorists in the 1970s began to argue that environmental problems require a new system of political organization 
that are based on new set of values. So, to tackle the climate change, we cannot address it adequately by following the conventional uh, system of political organization or set of values about individual, his rights or the community and uh, its rights and so on. So, we need a new set of values with new system of political organization to tackle uh, climate change or environmental problems. So, they argued that solving the environmental challenges require newer and fresh approach such as deep green version of anarchism. That is the individual can themselves uh, govern or protect or be responsive towards the environment. This would not necessarily lie to say any authority or institution or state and market. So, it is not the responsibility of someone out there to protect the environment. It is something which we all need to come together to develop the new consciousness and conviction towards protecting the environment. So, still many others argue that this challenge of climate change can be tackled within the existing political organization and set of values. So, they argue that we do not need to acquire or develop new set of values or uh, political institutions and organization, but within the existing structure of political organization and political system and the set of values that we have, we can tackle the environmental problems and environmental challenges. Now, these discussions whether we should go for new set of values or new system of political order or we should continue with our existing political structure and set of values to tackle the climate change turned into greater urgency when Green Party in Germany entered federal parliament in 1983. So, there the political discourse on climate change and environmental crisis was divided into two groups which we can basically call realos that is realist or the pragmatist and the fundis which is fundamentalists. So, within the uh, green parties there was a kind of division between those who believed in the existing political system or a structure and operating within that to tackle the climate change. So, those are called realos or the realists and uh, uh, later who wanted to change the existing structure or existing system of political order, they were called the fundamentalist or the fundis. So, former wanted the power within the existing political structure to uh, tackle the climate change, the later challenged the existing political system as a whole to create a new order, new values. So, they dominated the discourse and popularized the slogan, neither left nor right but ahead. So, the climate change or the environmental problem is seen as the major problem and therefore, the ideological divide on the basis of left and right is really immaterial because what we need to address uh, collectively together is this climate change and environmental crisis which pose a serious challenge to the humanity, to the uh, species on the planet as a whole. So, they were committed to these four pillars of a ecology, social responsibility, democracy and non-violence. So, their whole approach to the environmental problem or the crisis revolves around these four key components of ecology, social responsibility, democracy and non-violence. So, those were the ideals or the guiding principles for them to tackle the environmental challenges. So, since then the environmental laws in Germany and many other countries of the world developed rapidly. Germany is seen as the most strict country in terms of implementing environmental protection laws in Europe and since 1991, it functions on the principle of polluter pays that requires manufacturers or the retailers to take responsibility for recycling and disposing of the products that they sell or produce. So, it has also led to a number of green utopian thinking and theorization of state, politics, democracy and citizenship in different countries. Now, environmental crisis if you try to understand is a long term problem. Global warming, resource depletion, depletion of ozone layers, localized pollution, decline in the species are some of the major characteristic of contemporary environmental crisis. The climate change that is underway is to a great extent caused by emission of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide. 
So, while to some extent everyone has contributed in it, that means in the contemporary environmental crisis, responsibility lies with each one of us. So, everyone to some extent has contributed to this current environmental crisis. However, the role of advanced industrial society are far more greater. So, the consumptions, the greenhouse gas emissions in advanced industrial society is many times higher than say a developing or a least developed country. So, it is a global problem beyond the purview of a single society or a nation. It can only be addressed collectively because no one country, no matter how much superior uh, economically and military can tackle this problem of climate change. Because the behavior of one country and their consumptions, their set of values or their preference may affect the efforts that is taken by another countries to mitigate climate change. And therefore, there is a need to universal consensus on climate change or emissions of greenhouse gases and so on. And for that, every year or every two year, there is negotiation at international level or at many community levels or uh, supranational level as well. So, climate change has both the local and global dimension and tackling it requires efforts from both local as well as at the global level. So, the main challenge in curbing climate change is that the effects of climate change are probabilistic. So, we know certain things are because of the climate change, but we cannot be very sure about the exact relationship between that thing or the climate change. However, we now agree that uh, climate change is perhaps the major factor in a lot of social political changes that is happening across the world. So, the major problem in tackling the climate change is that the effect of climate change are probabilistic in nature rather than deterministic. And therefore, there are a number of people or groups who are apprehensive about the whole climate change discourse. In fact, there are some who actually deny the theory of climate change. In many countries like US, you have uh, deniers or those who deny the change in the climate change and so on. So, climate change can cause floods or droughts, heat waves or cold snaps. It can also have some indirect impacts such as in causing wars, famines and also refugee flows in different parts of the world. This often it impacts are invisible, however, its effects are felt across the world or across the globe both globally and internationally and there are various efforts and campaigns launched to confront it. And that put enormous stress on the existing democratic structure and institution to respond to it in a positive and effective manner. So, now we will very briefly look at what are the democratic response to the climate change. So, environmental crisis and climate change pose a serious challenge to the democratic system as it exists today. And politics which is understood as who gets what, when, where and how. So, politics which is largely seen as a pragmatic science uh, that is about a struggle for power and politics determines who get power, how much, when and how. So, uh, this conventional understanding of uh, politics is based on interest groups and may not be seen as adequate enough to address the problem of climate change. So, one of the reason for that is many who will be the most affected by climate change or environmental crisis do not participate in the reigning political system. So, they who are actually the victim of climate change or environmental crisis may not have the scope or the opportunity to participate in climate change dialogue. So, they are non-human natural world, the future generation, citizens of other countries and even the disenfranchised or alienated citizen of one's own country. So, they are the real victim or stakeholders in the climate change discussions and debates, but they are not given enough scope and participation in the climate change debates or agreements. So, political campaigns in most of the modern democracies have become more of a branding which is less likely to promote civilized and rational debates on issue of public interest such as climate change and so on. So, it basically tries to hit the deep rooted 
emotions of citizens and thereby it hardly allow any serious rational debates on issue of national and global political interests such as climate change which will affect the community or the lives of in a nation in the long term. So, politics is about the immediate pragmatic concerns of individual and society and uh, the political parties or the political leaders who believes in branding uh, their image and then uh, the voters or the electorates are merely uh, associating themselves with uh, one brand or the another thereby do not engage in a critical rational manner to some uh, issues of uh, long term interest that is climate change or environmental crisis and so on. And therefore, the politics in the conventional sense is seen as not an adequate response to the climate change in many of the modern democracy. Now, what are then the response to uh, this conventional uh, politics? So, one is the idea of deliberative democracy. So, it is often argued that a deliberative democracy which is based on reflective views or opinions of uh, the communities and that shapes the politics or the policy makings in the country will ultimately lead to some kind of rational or regional arguments and debates about uh, climate change. So, a deliberative democracy which is guided by reason and free speech and citizens are driven by certain core values may help people become more concerned about the climate change and global warming. So, this is one kind of response to climate change or environmental challenge that in a deliberative democracy which is largely driven by reason or the free speech where the citizen has certain core value can possibly educate or make the people aware about the climate change and global warming and thereby it will lead to change in the values, norms, preference of the individual which will help in protecting the environment and so on. This is one of the response to the climate change or environmental challenges. However, some theorists have argued that instead of deliberative democracy, we should focus more on changing our conception of citizenship. So, instead of a thin notion of citizenship that is about merely paying tax, obeying laws, defending the nation and voting, they argue about a thick notion of citizenship which would govern a much broader set of relationships. So, the notion of environmental citizenship would make people aware about and responsive to climate change. It would include the welfare of people across the national boundaries, future generation and even non-humans. So, uh, another kind of response to climate change and environmental is not just having a deliberative uh, democracy but to change the conception of citizenship where citizenship is seen or understood not by merely paying tax or obeying law within a nation state, but to develop a consciousness which include or accommodate the interest and welfare of the uh, other people across the national boundaries, also the future generations and the non-humans in the planet. So, the idea is to have environmentally responsible citizen who would engage deliberately in a democratic society in such a way that would contribute meaningfully to confront challenges like climate change. So, in order to have an environmentally responsible citizens, some of the following green values need to be inculcated and these green values are A, to develop a love of nature and living lightly on earth. So, taking minimum from the earth and having a relationship with nature where you love or protect or do not exploit, control or trim the nature. B, self restraint and moderation will help promote minimize their consumption and over consumption. So, if the individual or uh, citizens are moderate or self restrained, that will lead to less and less consumptions and avoid over consumption which will ultimately lead to protection of natural resources and thereby natural environment and so on. So, they should develop the value of living simply and moderately so that others may also live simply and moderately. Mindfulness is seen as antidote to some of the ills of modern capitalist society and a mindful person shall be conscious of the consequences of his or her actions and behavior 
which may be remote in time and space. So, what they do? So, the way climate change occur is a very technologically sophisticated uh, understanding is required to understand the cause and effects of climate change. So, what a person do today, it may affect the climate change in the long term or what a person do in one remote location of the world may have influence or effect in other parts of the world. So, a mindful person is always aware of his consumptions, his behaviors or actions which will affect the climate change and she will not therefore, thought uh, lessly emit climate uh, gases. So, to uh, develop a new consciousness or new uh, responsible, environmentally responsible citizen, we need to inculcate these green values or what we call green virtues. So, now if we bring these three democratic responses that is deliberative democracy, environmental citizenship and the green virtue together, we get a fair idea of what kind of society is required to confront the global climate change. However, it also require some kind of modification of many of our social, political and cultural values and also the preferences that we have. So, whether liberal democracy in its present forms with many of its current premises or value premises are helpful in creating such society. What would be the model of development? Should we continue with present capitalist market oriented model of development or should we look for some alternative model of development? So, should it also include sustainability keeping in mind the demands and needs of not just the current generation, but also the future generation and the non-humans? What is the justice? It is just about economic resources or distribution of economic resources or should it include the notion of environmental justice. Should it always be anthropocentric that is always giving preference to human over the non-human? These are some of the questions which requires deeper and critical engagements by individuals, communities, state, market and global institution. Now, some of these questions and issues which are there that is related to environmental crisis or environmental problem which we will discuss in the next lecture. So, that is all in today's lecture for the themes or the contents that we have discussed in this lecture. You can refer to some of this book like Robert Goodin, Green Political Theory from uh, John Drazek and N. Philip. You read a chapter on environment from the Oxford Companion to Political Theory. And Katriana McKinnon has a particular chapter on climate change or environmental crisis and democratic response, which is very helpful to understand some of the changes in the political values, social values that is required to uh, tackle climate change. So, from issues in political theory, you can look at that chapter. And again, from John Huffman and Paul Graham, Introduction to Political Theory, you can read a chapter on uh, climate change and environmental problem. So, that is all in today's lecture. Thanks for listening and do write to us for your comments, queries and feedback. We will be happy to respond. Thank you.